Schlag, I'm so sorry. Oh, you're fine. Um, received her PhD in 2015 from UCLA and received among awards the, the uh, Distinguished Doctoral Dissertation Award. She uh, teaches history of modern Europe and the uh, Mediterranean, a specialty of history of modern France, the uh, African Empire, and modern Jewish history. Uh, her lectures are colonialism, religious and legal regimes, religion and identity, politics of difference, and citizenship. She has a publication under review in the Muslim history that never was religious differences in colonial order in French Algiers and also was at Harvard University for a postdoc and at the Ecole des Hautes Etudes en Sciences Sociales de Paris. And she's going to have a baby <laughs> on January 1st. So, no baby. <laughs> Thanks, Rosemary. Um, Thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, on May 12, 1901, the journal Le Français published an article titled Protestant Peril, which declared, there is a Protestant question just like there is a Jewish and Masonic question. For the unnamed author, there was a disproportionate number of Protestants working as public servants throughout French society, uh, an outsized presence that suggested a problem for French Catholics. This problem, the existence of the Protestant peril, as the author claimed, suffocates us. To say this, the author concluded, is not to be clerical as we are ceaselessly told. It is to state obvious facts. It is to protest against the privileges enjoyed by Protestants to the detriment of Catholics. It is to claim a place in the sun in our own country. Little about this rhetoric in 1901 would have surprised many in France or Algeria amid the exposed events of the Dreyfus Affair, just over three years after Emile Zola published his famed letter to the President of the Republic, decrying the miscarriage of justice that wrongfully convicted the French Jewish military officer, Alfred Dreyfus, um, of treason, and embroiling France in a battle over the future of its republic and the meaning of its national identity. The Dreyfus Affair famously divided the French nation between those who supported the sham conviction of Dreyfus, bolstered by the forces of anti-Semitism, blood and soil nationalism, and traditional institutions like the Catholic Church and the military, against those who supported Dreyfus and his innocence among a coalition of liberals, Freemasons, Jews, and Protestants. And these divisions erupted into a vitriol that dominated culture, society, and politics in France, but moreover in France's most important colony, these divisions culminated in the wave of anti-Semitic electoral victories and violence in Algeria. The Dreyfus Affair is one of the most well-documented events in French history, and the meaning and consequences of this event has, both sustained, has sustained both popular and scholarly interest for well over a century. For contemporaries and for scholars, for subsequent scholars, the affair was clearly about more than the case of a French Jewish officer accused of betraying his nation. Indeed, over a century, scholarship has shown that the affair was about both deep-seated anxieties about Republican France as an institution, an ideology, and identity, as well as fin de siècle anxieties about the health and future of France as a national community, increasingly understood in racial terms. In other words, these anxieties are about the place of an assimilated French religious minority, and the broader place of religion, and especially Catholicism, at the heart of the secularizing republic and anxieties about how to define, defend, and bind together a culturally and racially diversifying empire stretching across the globe. So what new can be said about a historic event that continues to be the subject of so much scholarship? Not quite 20 years ago, J.P. Dotton wrote that despite the voluminous literature on the affair's impact in France and Algeria, quote, it is striking how few histories consider its role in empire, end quote. Particularly, he stressed that given that the 12 years from Dreyfus' affair in 1894 to his final vindication in 1906 coincided with one of the most aggressive phases of French colonial expansion and consolidation. Indeed, Dotton's research has demonstrated how the affair shaped efforts to bolster France's empire in surprising ways, animating battles um, over religion, national identity, and imperial expansion in Madagascar and into China that blurred traditionally understood divisions at the heart of the affair. Furthermore, subsequent scholarship has shown how divisions, ideologies, and allegiances were blurred in the context of the metropole and appropriated elsewhere in the empire, like the Algerian Sahara. While many scholars have explored 
how the Dreyfus affair played out in Algeria, where anti-Semitism and anxieties about French citizenship had been mounting since the 1870s in response to Muslim unrest and the newly enfranchised populations of Algerian Jews and non-French Europeans, this paper seeks to tell the story of the Dreyfus Affair in French Algeria in a new way. Um, and I should confess, very new to me, um, since it's my first story out of the early period of French Algeria. But the story I'm trying to make sense of here is how the anti-Semitic backlash against Algerian Jews intersected with broader anxieties that targeted other colonial religious groups. Intersectional anxieties about Protestantism, the Catholic Church, Muslims, foreigners, empire, and the legacies of 1789 that, specific to my examination, embroiled two Protestant clerics in Algeria. Arthur Lilly, a, Protestant, a British Protestant minister based in Muskeganem, a northwestern town near Oron, and Frederick Yangel, a British Protestant pastor based in Mascara, a northwestern town south of, of Bonn. Both of these clerics were at the center of a series of scandals in the 1890s that fueled vitriol and frustration in their respective communities, in the Algerian press, in correspondence between French officials, and in the Chamber of Deputies. And yet these scandals have eluded the interest of scholars. By restoring the Lilly and Yandel affairs to a shared context with both the Dreyfus affair and the broader history of French Algeria, what can we say about the well-documented role that Jewish difference and French citizenship played in shaping the social, political, and cultural climate of this colony? More specifically, what can we say about the role that religious and ethnic difference played in shaping fantasy of Algeria? What I'm going to attempt to argue here is that in offering a window into the untold story of these two clerics, we can tell the history of both the Dreyfus Affair and French Algeria in new and yet familiar ways. In other words, we can see how the feverish concerns and suspicions about British Protestant clerics in the 1890s were not fundamentally different, I would argue, from perceptions of non-French populations, specifically European Christians and Algerian Jews during the early decades of France's conquest of North Africa. This is to suggest that though the perception and treatment of clerics like Lily and Yandel were certainly informed by the political divisions and cultural circumstances of the Dreyfus Affair. The Dreyfus Affair, I argue, merely offered a high-profile platform to readdress long-standing fears about non-normative French identity and the future of French empire. This builds on the work of many scholars who argue that the Dreyfus Affair did not introduce anti-Semitism into French politics, but rather offered an opportunity to bolster long-standing anti-Semitism into a full-fledged political ideology. And yet what is also new here, relative to the history of French Algeria, is the fact that his, the history of Protestants in 19th century Algeria, let alone the ways in which they were scrutinized and judged alongside non-French Catholics and Algerian Jews, largely remains to be written. To make that point, let's return to that 1901 article about the Protestant peril. As I said, no one would have been particularly surprised by an article that targeted Protestants alongside Jews and Freemasons as a threat to Catholics liberties in fantasy of France, except that the article did not stop there. Place the issue of the Protestant peril within a broader colonial context, obliquely naming these two scandals that had gripped Algeria during the prior decade. For this author, the so-called suffocating reach of the Protestant peril extended to Algeria, its ministries, prefectures, courtrooms, and classrooms, stuffed with sectarians and Protestants. It is in Algeria, the author emphasized, with the Methodists who distribute Bibles and gunpowders to the natives in Mascara, where we've seen Protestants who call themselves French favor of English influence. A, pres a presence known throughout French embassies, consulates, and in the highest colonial offices, the author warned, thanks to the missionaries sal salaried by England who prepare with decatholicization of future invasions, just as Prussians did prior to 1870. Who were these Protestant clerics who were allegedly joining the ranks of Alfred Dreyfus to threaten French security, who was distributing, distributing buyers and munitions to ostensibly rested uh, natives, and who was seditiously using purported French allegiances to further British imperial influence? Though the author did not name these clerics, they were Frederick Yandel and Arthur Lilly, whose notoriety had captivated both the French colonial press and the Chamber of Deputies, but not the attention of subsequent scholars. 
Yandel, a resident of Jersey, was nominated as a Presbyterian pastor in Mascara in 1889, while Lilly worked in partnership with his wife as a Methodist missionary in Mostaganem since the mid-1880s. Despite the fact that much ink was spilled over the allegedly threatening work of both men, and more specifically, the immoral conduct of Yandel and the seditious activities of Lilly, as I've said, their cases have really elicited very little interest. And this is likely because Protestants in 19th century Algeria, settlers and missionaries, French and non-French Europeans, continue to warrant considerable investigation, um, something that my own scholarship has attempted to address during the early decades of the conquest of Algeria. Both Yandel and Lilly immediately attracted the suspicion of colonial authorities due to their legal identities as foreign nationals. In fact, it was the question of Yandel's legal identity that provoked considerable debate about his nomination as pastor of Mascara to the extent that his appointment was stalled for years, leaving him and his community in a provisional state. This was likely because, unlike Lilly, Yandel was not a missionary, working in the service of an evangelical organization. Instead, Yandel was hired to serve the community of Mascara under the auspices of the Protestant consistory based in Oran. The Protestant consistory was part of a colonial religious administration that was established in the French held Algerian territories in the 1830s and 40s to govern Catholic and Protestant settlers and Algerian Jews. In many ways, it was the product of an earlier Napoleonic effort, as we've heard. Um, in metropolitan France to centralize and consolidate state authority, which culminated in legally recognizing religious practice after the revolution, which meant in 1801 this process legalized Catholicism, placing its administration and budget in the hands of the French state, and in 1802 and 1808, Napoleon established consistories of Protestantism and Judaism, therefore officially recognizing and subsidizing these new faiths, these two faiths, in exchange for state oversight. <coughs> The difference between the administration of Catholics, Protestants, and Jews in France, as opposed to the co-religious religionists in Algeria, came down to the question of legal identity and the harsh realities of colonial conquest. This is to argue that in the context of the chaotic and violent push into North Africa, French officials found themselves desperate to stabilize their grasp over a diverse territory, turning to a familiar method to manage religious diversity in the interest of stabilizing state power. They did so by establishing a Catholic diocese in Algiers in 1838, a Protestant consistory in 1839, and a Jewish one in 1845. By erecting a colonial religious administration, they targeted religious difference as both an obstacle to be managed and an instrument of colonial order. Indeed, this system was explicitly established to oversee the moralizing and civilizing of predominantly non-French communities of Spanish, Maltese, and German Christian settlers, as well as Algerian Jews. That the Algerian consistorial system was designed to ensure the assimilation and civilization of Catholics, Protestants, and Jews alike, this was precisely why, I would argue, colonial officials were so frustrated when the consistory of Oran nominated a non-Frenchman to serve as an agent of French civilization, especially against the backdrop of the 1890s. Indeed, according to consistorial policies, pastors and rabbis were functionaries of the state and expected to be French, to minister in French, and to reaffirm French cultural values. The conditions of the conquest and settlement of Algeria meant that there were not always enough cler French clerics for hire, let alone clerics who were able and willing to support the civilizing mission. For this very reason, Yandel's legal status stalled his approval process into the mid-1890s, mid um, during which an Algerian Jewish cleric in nearby Bonn was likewise making headlines for very similar reasons. Joseph Stora was an Algerian-born, Paris-trained, and French naturalized rabbi who had served the consistorial community of Bonn for several years before one of his sermons outraged newspapers and French officials on both sides of the political spectrum. In 1892, Stora was condemned for allegedly preaching the value of a Jewish education alongside a secular French education and doing so to great outrage in Arabic, uh, which led to extensive consistorial investigation. Stora's religious and ethnic identity was cast as a threat to France's civilizing mission, much like Yandel's legal identity. Elevating Stora's infamy further, one Republican newspaper even claimed, quote, this rabbi is visibly overexcited by the African sun, whose deadly influence Cardinal Davijavi has often experienced, 
end quote, therefore placing Stora, the Rabbi Stora, alongside the Archbishop of Algiers and the founder of the White Fathers Mission, and frequently named enemy of the Republic. Unlike Pastor Yandel and Rabbi Stora, however, Arthur Lilly did not work as a servant of the French colonial state. Rather, Lilly was a missionary with the North African Mission, a London-based evangelical organization. And just as Yandel's early years in Mascara were marred by concerns about his nationality, Lily's early years in Los Tegan were likewise shaped by concerns over his legal identity, the source of his income, and the target audience of his labors. In the case of Yandel, members of the Chamber of Deputies de debated the outrage of a British citizen being paid by the French state to spread French civilization to a predominantly non-French or newly French community. But in the case of Lily, outrage among deputies fixated on the fact that not only was he British, but he was supported by British funds and using those resources to target his Protestant activities at a largely non-French community, both Christian and European settlers and Algerian Muslims, and doing so without colonial or consistorial oversight. Indeed, the concern that foreign missionaries were seeking to undermine French colonial authority was so heightened in the era of the Dreyfus Affair and high imperial expansion that under pressure from deputies, French leaders banished foreign missionaries from regions in North Africa that were not fully under French administrative rule and seen as hotbeds of revolt and instability. So by way of conclusion, by the early to mid-1890s, against the backdrop of rising anti-Semitism and increased concern about foreigners and Muslims threatening the integrity of French colonial rule, perceptions of Yandel and Lily took a particularly scandalous turn. And these men were ultimately forced to leave Algeria. In March 1893, the president of the Protestant consistory in Oran published a letter in the Vies Libre defending Yandel against accusations that he had impregnated and abandoned two young women during his earlier time in Jersey. Several days later, a letter published in the Petit Africain denounced him as the Juif at home of Protestantism in Mascara, asking, Why did we choose a foreigner who could have had a French person? in this position. A year later, in June 1894, a series of investigations into the so-called itinerant pastor of Mustaganum led to accusations that Lily's proselytizing threatened to upset Muslim communities, and by extension, France's purported commitment to protect their religious freedoms, thereby subverting French interests in North Africa. Concerns about the missionary Lily's activities and allegiances only grew from there. The local police got involved, investigating claims that he was conspiring with Spanish sailors against France and spreading Bibles and gunpowder to Muslim communities. In late 1895, the North African Mission Journal reported that the Lilies were being subject to, quote, almost daily attacks in the local newspaper, resulting in rousing suspicions about them and their work and harassing police inquiries. And the notoriety of Lily and Yandel continued to heighten to the extent that the deputies in Paris in late 1896 were denouncing their work and claiming that Lily in particular was surely running both, quote, a vast espionage network that tightens around us and a propaganda of disaffection under the guise of his proselytism. While the Yandel and Lily affairs have largely escaped the notice of historians, the accusations and suspicions that encircled them were familiar to people in France and France and Algeria. Their stories reaffirmed the ways in which Dreyfus era anxieties about the fate of France intersected in powerful ways that reaffirmed, as I tried to suggest, long standing concerns about religious difference in an expanding and diversifying French imperial republic. Concerns born of a violent and uncertain colonial conquest that fixated on religious and ethnic difference as both an obstacle to and an instrument of French colonial authority. 